Hey everybody, welcome back. It's Alan getting into a new chapter now, chapter three, I titled Deriving Derivatives. Yes, I know it seems a bit redundant. This is probably the most important chapter in this entire course. So you can see it's got quite a bit more than what we're used to, almost twice as many as the last chapter. So lots of things that we're gonna get into, but we're gonna start with this very first one and just defining what the derivative is. Then we'll talk about it as a function, some rules of it, how to use it, and then all the other types of things that we can do with it and various types of functions. So buckle up, it's gonna be a long one, chapter three, but you know this first one, usually a little bit longer than the others simply because we have to lay out all of the foundation of the chapter. So here we go with defining the derivative. So what is a derivative? It's basically just a quicker way for us to be able to find the slope of a function. Now, remember I talked to you guys about that when I introduced those GeoGebra slides. And again, that is the basis of this entire course, at least first semester calculus. So the better that you can understand this concept and these sections from chapter three, the better off you're going to be in chapter four, five, and then in second semester calculus. So really work on it. We're going to talk about different ways that we represent slope. And so we're going to do that real quick before we actually get into what a derivative is. So you all know that the slope is just the change in the y's over the change in the x's. And we use this symbol here. It's a Greek letter delta to represent that, which we can then expand and write it as. Now, remember, that's just one way to represent the most basic algebraic way that we learn to represent slope. Here's a few others. So whether it's written like this, that, or that, we are basically doing and finding the same thing. The slope, we use M to represent that between two points. So whether the two points are written like this, x2, y2, x1, y1, or x comma f of x, a comma f of a, or even saying that between those two points, let's say that this is my x this is the other so rather than calling it x and a or x2 and x1 we can say you know what there's actually a little bit of a gap between these called h so then this would be x plus h and if this is my function whether it's curvy or straight if that's my function then this would be f of x for my height, and this would be f of x plus h for that one. So then it would be my y2 minus y1 over the x2 minus x1, which the x's would then cancel out and we just have the h, the difference in my x's. All right, so we will explore all of these different ways, and you can probably guess one is probably going to be better than the other because we want to narrow this down and just call it the derivative. And by looking at these, which one would you say is the easiest? I'd probably say either the blue or the purple, but based on the bottom, the denominator, that would be the easiest. The tops, those are definitely easier to work with than that. And plugging in x plus h to our function. So there will be times that we will use this. There will be times that we use this. And we are going to get away from that and keep it for algebra. All right, so let's keep moving on and seeing where we're going with this. Well, one of those is actually got its own name because we use it so much, and it's actually called the difference quotient. And that takes us to chapter three, section one, definition one. We call the difference quotient either that form or that form, the two that we said that we would use in calculus versus the y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1 to find our slope. The difference quotient, because that's exactly what it does, it finds the difference of your y's and your x's and divides them. How do we label these two things? See right below the graphic of the difference quotient for each. Remember, to find the slope, we need two points. So if I say pick a point, any point, and you call it a, then to find it on my function, I would plug in that a to get f of a. 
And likewise, choose another x, and we will find that by plugging it into our function f of x. So the change in our y's over the change in our x's yields that. And we call this the slope of, hopefully you remember that from way back when I showed you guys the initial start of chapter two in those GeoGebra slides, a secant. Likewise, over here, let's call it something different. Pick a point, any point. And let's say that there is a gap between those two points of H. Well, then if this first one is A, and I say that this is a gap of H, then this one would be A plus H. So that would be your X value. And to find your Y, you would plug it into your function. Likewise here, difference in my Ys over the difference in my Xs. A plus H minus the A. Well, then the A minus the A cancels, and we're just left with the H in the denominator. Okay, so that is called the difference quotient. But because we're dealing with two points, that formula, that slope formula, only finds the average rate of change or slope of a secant, we called it. What we want to be able to figure out is what is called the instantaneous rate of change. That means we need to take it from two points to one instant, one point. And what kind of line would we take for the two points to one point? That is called a tangent line. But the problem is we said that no matter what form we had it in, any of those three forms that I reintroduced to you at the beginning of this, there were two points required. So again, hopefully you recall from the very beginning of chapter two, 2.1 video, when I did those GeoGebra slides, we took the two points and made that gap of what we called H get closer and closer and closer and closer and closer. We approached the other point. And remember the thing that we called approaching was the mathematical term of a limit. And by making those two points, one approach the other, that H will go to a gap of zero. We can't ever make it reach that because we still need those two points to find the slope, but that will take our secant line to a tangent line. And here are some graphs for you to see that process in still pictures. So instead of starting with any point and any other, call it X1, we want to take that secant line there and we want to move it to be even closer, call it X2. And notice that that line, still a secant, gets closer to what we actually want, which is this green one here called the tangent at the point in question. Now, again, if you don't want to just use X's, we could then go to a gap of H. So again, whether you use the H or the X and A, we need to make that gap, that second point approach and get closer so that we can actually find the slope of any function, any curve, not just a line, even though we're going to make it a line because that's the only thing we know how to find definitively. We want to find that tangent at a specific point. So here is the algebraic process in definition 3.12 to find the tangent line of a function at A. Whether you use this form or that form, notice these are just our slopes. What makes it of a tangent is that limit process where we make one point approach the other or the gap between them approach zero to get that tangent line, right? So hopefully these look familiar to you because they are just our slope. What makes it calculus is that we're taking two points and converging, moving one towards another so that we actually find the slope at that value. And because we will be wanting to find this so often, we are going to give it a name. Rather than the slope of the tangent or instantaneous rate of change, which are both a mouthful, we're going to call it, you can probably guess, fill in that blank there, the derivative. And again, the name comes from deriving from the slope formula. Now, of course, because it can be very laborsome process to do 
all of this or all of that, as we saw with limits in the three techniques that we learned, plugging, chugging numerically, approaching from both sides of our value in question, graphing our function and seeing what it approaches from both sides, or even using some algebraic technique by simplifying, multiplying by a fancy one or what have you, we want to be able to even further simplify that process. So we're starting with naming it, which again, can use either, they are equivalent, but that's what chapter three is gonna be dedicated to once we learn how to find this initially. We will do it even quicker and call it the derivative. So here's the first, and you can see it's a very important definition for the derivative. 313, let a function be defined on an open interval that has the point or value of x, we're gonna call a, and the derivative of the function at that point, we will give the connotation of f, and the way that we're gonna say this is prime of a. So f prime of a, we gave it that symbol there, can now be defined as either this or that, and we will say the derivative, that symbol there, is equivalent to both. And you may be wondering, well, why both? Sometimes it'll be better to do it at a specific point. Other times it'll be better to do it more generically and just say that a gap of H that is approaching zero. So one more time, the process of actually finding the derivative, it is called differentiation. Okay, that is the act of taking the derivative. We call it differentiation. I know. A mouthful, that's right. So this is going to be what we're going to study for this entire chapter. Okay, and remember, it is just our algebra slope formula with that new thing we learned in chapter two called a limit. Now remember, there's also going to be that real world application stuff that we'll get into as well down the road. And instead of just using X's and Y's, we'll change the X axis to T and the y-axis to s, where t is going to represent our time, and s will be the position after a certain amount of time. Now, remember, I've done this already uh, at the beginning of the course, the very first video, talked about being impressed whether or not I rode my bike to campus. So we changed the two points from 0, 0 to uh, 2, 10, or 20, whatever I chose. and we talked about how it would find the average rate of change or my speed or velocity. Well, if we applied the derivative to the average rate of change from two points and we use that limit process to take it down to one, what do you think that would find for us? Well, that takes us to definition 314, the average velocity, right? So we will denote it by S of T, to be our position function. And if we wanted to find the average velocity, that would be our two points, just like we did with the bike. And we would find the change in our Y values over the change in our X values. That would be our average velocity. But if we wanted to do the derivative to the average, now it would change that velocity to instantaneous velocity or instantaneous rate of change. So instead of some value, call it A, that our T is approaching, our time, and still finding the difference in our Ys over the difference in our Xs, now we will throw this limit in front of it, and that takes it from the average velocity to the instantaneous velocity, or S prime of A will be what we now call V of A. All right, so new stuff, but still just basic, basic algebra, a little bit more advanced. That's all calculus is, is extreme algebra. We're actually taking two points and now we're moving them to become one at some instant. So we're going to venture out and try to find quicker alternative to finding all of this without having to go through that entire limit process by either numerically, graphically, geometrically, or algebraically, those three techniques that we learned in chapter two. 
So I like to believe that you are learning why finally you learned all that algebra. Again, just basic stuff with slope of some line, now a specific one we're calling a tangent. So a question I want to pose to you is, if I ask you to find the equation of the line for that tangent at some point on some function, I know it seems like a lot, but we're really just trying to find the equation of a line. Do you remember how to do that? How would you find the equation of a tangent line at a specific point? Have you ever had to come up with an equation of a line before? Absolutely. You guys are in calculus. To get to this point, you've had to done this quite a few times. Whether it was in algebra, algebra two, all the algebra courses that you've taken, pre-algebra, pre-calculus, college algebra, whatever you've seen up to this point, I know you've done this many, many times over. So let's review very quickly because it's not going away anytime soon. We reviewed this in chapter one. Two of the forms used to find an equation of any line are slope intercept and point slope. And if you recall what they are, slope intercept was the one that most remember, and point slope. So remember when we had a point and the slope, and it is the only difference is I asked you to find the equation of a tangent line. So although you can use this or this, either way, what we have to find first is the slope, but of the tangent line at that specific point, we can call a comma f of a. So of the two techniques, slope intercept and point slope, I much prefer point slope because that's exactly what they gave us was a point and a slope, but they just worded it differently. At a specific point will be my x1, y1, and the tangent line, meaning we want what to be replaced for that m, whether you use slope intercept or point slope. What is that m going to become now? It will be that slope of the tangent that they asked us for. Okay, so if you can see that this is the exact same that we've always dealt with since algebra one, pre-algebra, lines and their equations, using the slope, whether you use slope intercept or point slope, again, I much prefer point slope because it's just a little bit simpler to work with in my opinion. It's a little bit easier to finish. You're gonna have to find that derivative, which is the slope of our tangent. So to rewrite this for you, in definition 3.16, I will change out the whole x1 and y1 and actually put in that value of a. So remember we said that if we let x equal a, that would be a comma f of a. And so that would be my x1, y1. So rewriting it as y minus y1 equals m times x minus x1. Notice we just replaced the a with the x1 and the f of a where the y1 was. But the key is that you know that the slope is the slope of a tangent, which means we need to find the derivative of our function at that value. Here it is a little bit more succinctly written right underneath so that you can see the changes. Now, sometimes it may ask you to put it into slope intercept form. So all you'll have to do is distribute that slope of the tangent and then add over that y value. Nothing that you haven't done before. I still think it's easier to use that than the slope intercept form. So again, just be careful with these. You're still just plugging in three things. And if they don't ask you to put it into slope intercept or y equals mx plus b form, all you do is clean up any double negatives, and I'm good with you leaving it like this. You've made it to calculus. Here's the first part of it. Keep working hard, my math family, and we'll continue on this journey and making it as simple as possible. Take care, everyone. Alan, out.